Amen. We want to we want to welcome everybody who's joining us. You're joining us by however you are in the media, whatever. And we want to thank you for joining us. We are excited to be with you today and to have you. And we are excited about the series we're doing <coughs> on the things we're talking about and we got a really awesome thing we're going to share with you today. And so I want you to tune in and listen carefully. How many know God wants to clean up the church? Yes. Now, this is, uh, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, just the church. But, but, but I, I really believe that we need to understand there are certain principles that we need to understand so that we can live free from demonic um, attacks and things. Amen. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Now I want you to go to Joshua chapter 1. And I'm going to take you through the Bible a little bit. And then we're going to share a few things um, out of my life. I like to do that. I like to give you some illustrations. And in Joshua chapter 1, of course, this is one of the most cool chapters in the Bible. Everybody say cool. cool. Got some really cool principles in it. And I, I like Joshua. Joshua is a book of real victory, but there is one place here in Joshua we, we see where some things happen we need to pay attention to. Now, let's read ver, uh, chapter 1 starting at verse 1. And I'm reading out of the King James Version this morning. Don't have the Amplified because I just don't have that much wind. Okay. <laughs> verse 1. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying... Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, now and all this people, into the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall, spread, uh, shall, shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness, the Lebanon, unto the great river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with thee. I will not fail thee. I will not forsake thee. Sounds like Jesus. Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide an inheritance of the land which I swear to thy fathers to give them. How many know that's pretty good, that's pretty good uh, motivation there? In other words, if you do what I tell you to do here, nothing and nobody will stop you. Praise God. Amen. Verse 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest deserve to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For when thou shalt do this, it will make thy way prosperous. You'll have good success. You'll deal all wisely in all the affairs of life. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, you will go forward and nothing will be able to, uh, to stop you in your prosperity and in your ministry and in your life. Everybody say amen. amen. Now that is a powerful promise. And God gave that to them. And he was, and, and you'll find out as you begin to read the book of Joshua, that anybody who came against them, man, they would just get creamed. They'd get their clock creamed. Everybody say amen. It was like the best football team in the history of the world. You know, they just could not be beaten. They, if, as long as they stayed and did what God said, in, in God, there was no foe, no demon, nothing, 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 nothing. That could stop them from living in the blessings and promises and awesome power and the anointing and protection of Almighty God. Amen. However, when we skip over to Joshua chapter 7, we see something happen here that's very interesting. And I wanted to point this out to you this morning because this is something that was brought to my attention a few weeks ago that I needed to share and I might even do again next week I don't know but in Joshua chapter 7 starting at verse 1 let's read we'll read down through here it says but the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing everybody say the accursed thing, the accursed thing. for Achan the son of Carmi the son of Zabdi the son of Zerah you know when I get to heaven these guys are all gonna go well, you sure you sure mess my name up bad when you and I'll say you know what uh, sorry, but who cares? All right, here we go. The son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. 
Everybody say a cursed thing. Things can be cursed. I want, I, now you have to understand, I want you all to look up at me here. These people that they were dealing with were heathens of the extreme kind. These people that they were dealing with were people that worshipped other gods. These people that they were dealing with were occultists. They were very well trained in the art of everything nasty and bad and disgusting. They worshipped devils. Some of them knew it. Some of them thought they were other gods. But they were devils. God did not like that. In fact, there were places in the Old Testament, people ask me, why would, why would God do that? Where he says, you go in there and you kill them, all of them, including their children and even their cattle and their animals. Yep. Now, why would God do that? Because he knew the power of the demonic things that were taking place there, and he wanted those people wiped out because if they weren't, and even their animals were they were using in these occultic things, and demons were being transferred into animals and everything else, would affect the very people of God, and did when the people of God, be, when the people of God began to compromise and mix with, if I can use this term, the world. God told them, wipe them all out, kill them all, even the babies. And people, people don't understand that kind of thing. But you see, it was because if he didn't do that, if they, if they didn't do that, that would have spread so quick across the earth. It would have been like the days of Noah where he had to destroy the earth. That's what happened. Now, let's keep on reading here because I want you to see this. Uh, they took of the accursed thing and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Verse 2. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Bethvan, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. See, they, they, were, they knew that if God was with them, why hassle? Just send a few. If God's with us, we've been able to wipe everybody else out. See, and they were getting victory after victory after victory. They didn't need a whole lot of men. Just go up. We're going to wipe them out anyway. God's with us. Come on, everybody say amen. amen. That's how they were thinking. Yeah. And make not all the people to labor thither, because there's just a few. We'll wipe them out. I'm paraphrasing. So they went up thither, the people about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote them, about 30 and 6 men, for they chased them from before the gate even unto Sherebrim and smote them in the going down wherefore the hearts of the people melted and, they, and it became as water. They went up in this battle. Normally they're ripping everybody to shreds. It's like one of these movies. They're like superheroes. Nobody can stop them. But here they run and they get killed and they turn and, and they're, like, they're like dogs with their tail between their legs. Nothing's working for them. They're getting beat up left and right. What's the problem? Verse 6, Joshua rent his clothes. He knew something was wrong. Joshua is not stupid. He knew if we're not making a connection, it's not God's fault. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Joshua rent his clothes and fell on the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord of the presence of God. Under the eventide, he and the elders, and they put dust upon their heads. They're praying to God, and they're trying to get an answer. Lord, what's the deal on this thing? How many know that's a wise thing to do when things aren't working, folks? All right. And Joshua said, Alas, O thou Lord, wherefore hast thou all, at all brought these people ever of Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we have been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. What's going on here, Lord? O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns their back before the enemies? I got these people that were doing so good. Now this? You know how people are. People are going to side in with the negative most of the time, you know. From the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall in, in, uh, invi invite us around and cut off, <coughs> excuse me, cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto, unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, get thee up, wherefore it liest upon thy face. <laughs> I like that. Quit crying and bellyaching and get up. You know, uh, there was a man who had a, who, who had a vision. He went to heaven. And he stood before Jesus. 
And he hit the deck in front of Jesus and started crying, Lord, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. And he's, you know, I'm not even worthy to kiss your feet. And Jesus said, stand to thy feet. And he had fire in his eyes. And he, and he stood up and he said, my blood's made you worthy. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Take that in your religious pipe and smoke it. Okay, verse 11. Israel has sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing. Everybody say the accursed thing. The accursed thing. And have also stolen and dismembered also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Now, God had told them, do not touch or take anything out of those people's possession. Why? Why would it be? Because even the things that they owned and the articles that they owned and the things they had because of their occultic type of practices had power and even demonic influence that would go with it. Amen. Are you listening to me now? Now occultists know this. They've been doing this stuff for years. They know exactly how to try to attack Christians. Christians, most of them, aren't very smart. So they found out a long time ago, if they can find a way to infiltrate their home, then they can send demons in there and they'll, ha and they'll have perfect right to come right into your home. Yep. Whether you know it, whether you don't know it, doesn't make any difference. Yep. They'll have a right. And I'll, t I'll talk about that as we go here. Verse 12. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were a curse. Neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed thing among you. So let me speed this up. Everybody look up at me. They got together, found out who did this, God punished them, and then they got victory again. Amen. Once they got rid of this accursed thing and who did it. Now well, the accursed thing was some items. You've got to understand something about... <clears throat> This God, God's laws. The devil never comes up with anything. Uh, he, he's not creative. The devil just uses deception and all he can do is, is try to copy God. How many know he tries to do that with the gifts of the spirit? You know, he's got this psychic stuff. He tries to do it in every way. There's always a, a counterfeit to everything. You all, all know that what I'm talking about? Remember in the book of Acts, I don't have time to turn over there, but remember in the book of Acts, we might read it later, where Paul, the Bible says Paul, God was using Paul to do special miracles. From his body, they took handkerchiefs and, and napkins and, and aprons. And, and, and the anointing of God would go in there. And they would take it to a sick person or a demon-possessed person. And the demons would go out and the sick people would be healed. In other words, that anointing that was on Paul, that spiritual presence of Jesus Christ and God, would go with those particular items into a house and bring, bring, bring blessing. Yeah. Satan knows the principle. And he'll try to get into our homes by bringing things into our homes that are not good. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I want, to, I want you to listen to what I'm saying here because I know and realize that some of you are not going to, you know, especially the people that are watching me are, are going to hear this, some of you, maybe for the first time. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 18 real quick. Now, one of the reasons God was so hard on this was because you're not just dealing with human beings and their flesh. When you're dealing with the occult and you're dealing with cults and the occult and bad religion and all that, you're dealing with demonic things, folks. Demons. And I don't know, I'll have to give you some testimonies, but I don't know how many times I've seen this over the years, how when people found out about what I'm going to teach you today and acted on what I'm going to teach you today were set free. And the benefits were they'd been sick for years and then they were healed. Amen. The benefits were they'd been bound up with all kinds of weird stuff and confusion and depression and taking medications and everything else. But when they got this thing taken care of here and they found out about the principle and made some, some choices in their life to eradicate some things out of their life, that all left them. Amen. And I have to say, you know, I've been doing this now for 30 years. If this is an area that most Christians, quite frankly, that I've met over the years, don't pay any attention to. You go in their homes, you find all kinds of things in there. I'll talk about that in a minute. But in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9, when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abomination of those nations. Right? There shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or daughter to pass through the fire or that uses divination 
or as an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God uh, doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess hearken unto observers of time and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God has not suffered thee or allowed thee to do these things. Everybody say amen. amen. Now. What's he talking about? Well, every one of these type of practices has things that they use to use in these practices. Here, last, a few weeks ago, I got absolutely shocked when I was ministering to boy right here, sitting right here, that was involved in Satanism in Sturgeon Bay here with a group of kids. Now, I'm ministering deliverance to him, and I found out that the way he got involved in the occult was that the pa a pastor right over here in Sturgeon Bay had taught him and his youth group and, and told him it was okay to, to use the Ouija board. Now how many of you heard Julia's testimony about how when she used that Ouija board, her and I, by the way I met her brother on Facebook, he told me the other side of the story, very amazing. The Ouija board was the thing that she, that, that, that where those demons entered into her really took her over. Now, I'm sure she had some things before, but that was the big deal. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't only take one time sometimes. Whether you know it, whether you don't know it, whether you believe it, whether you don't believe it, it doesn't make any difference. Julia had been taught against those things. She knew it. She did it anyway. That's called rebellion. She suffered for it. I know kids who are using those type of things as playthings today. Dungeons and Dragons. They're on the internet. They're letting things into their home. They're watching the wrong kind of movies. What's happening? Satan's trying to get into the home. He's trying to get inside of people. In 1990, the Lord said, unless the thing turns around, there's going to come an explosion of demon possession and demonization into the youth of America like we've never seen. And this is the term he used. By the, the late 2000s, if it doesn't stop, it will look like zombies and the live, walking dead in our society. This will start a lot because of the occult. Are y'all listening to me? Say amen. Now, this person that was telling me this, I had a hard time believing it. Then it was confirmed by some other people that were in the youth group. Yep. Not only did this pastor that's here, and it's supposed to be a full gospel church. Some of you went to that church. This particular pastor took the youth group to a place where they were teaching them to levitate. Now, folks, out of that came a group of kids that got together and started a little satanic coven. And the only one that's not screwed up and out of it is this kid who's having some issues that we were trying to deal with. And I'm believing God to get him set free from these issues. But I, I'm telling you, every one of those kids is in jail. This is the path that takes people down and people don't even know how to trace what it is. It doesn't make any difference. Anytime that we read our horoscope. In fact, you know, let me tell you something about that. I see a lot of these Facebook Christians who have horoscopes on their Facebook pages. What in the world is going on with that? How does people think that that kind of thing's okay? Listen to this. Smile at me. It'll be okay. I'm, I'm going to help you with this. But see, we're dealing with a tough subject. I've got I to share some testimonies with you. How many know my wife Stella? Isn't she sweet? I mean, Stella's awesome, those who know her. And she's a little tiny thing, drink of water, weighs 115 pounds soaking wet. But she's tough on the devil. Everybody say amen. amen. When I first met my wife, Stella, we met at the Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, for a Saturday night rock and roll concert in, Los, in uh, Costa Mesa, California, 19, whatever it was. And <clears throat> the Lord said marry her, and she had a, a dream, and I had a... You know, the Lord talked to me and she had a dream. We knew we were supposed to be together. So we, we ended up getting married. Now, Stella was just a baby Christian when we married. And in fact, 
I got her filled with the Holy Ghost on my honeymoon. How many know, I, I, I said, before we do anything, anything at all, you're getting filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And so she did. But when you get filled with the Holy Ghost, a lot of times what happens is, is that things get stirred up. Now, little did I know, because... I, I, you know, I'm just, I, I, I'm here I am, I'm, I'm saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, I'm, the, I'm like the Apostle Paul, praying in tongues more than y'all, all day long, worshiping God, reading the Bible, excited about the things of God, jumping up and down, excited, having a great old time, every day, all day, pressing into God, and here comes my little wife, and she moves in with this guy, and she's not real comfortable with all this, because she doesn't know anything about it. And all of a sudden, we're having a, we're having a great time. I had a great honeymoon and everything went fine. But all of a sudden, my wife changed. She started staring out of the window. And her eyes would glass over. And it's like nobody was home. I couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. And I thought, what's going on here? And she started getting weirder and weirder over a period of about a week. I thought, man, this is really strange. And so I called my pastor up and I said, man, my, I, I think my wife, is, could it be possible that she's, she has demons or something? Because I was, I was suspecting something. Was one cry. I mean, he goes, no, it's just PMS. <laughs> That's what he told me. He says, you know, a lot of young men, they don't understand when they get married that their wife goes through this time. And he explained this to me. I said, I understand what that is. This is not what that is. If that's what this is, we're all in trouble. And... <laughs> So anyway, here I am, and, and it gets worse. All of a sudden, one time I'm looking at her, and I'm trying to get her attention. She turns around, and it wasn't her anymore. Her eyes rolled up in her head like one of these horror movies you see. And out of her spoke a man's voice and said all kinds of disgusting things and started cursing me. I thought, oh, man. And she's just sitting there. And her, her whole face would twist into this distorted face. And I'm going, welcome to the honeymoon here, you know. I mean, what's this? I looked at that and I thought, oh my God. And so I called my pastor up. I said, you got to get over here right now, man. We got issues. He comes over there and looks, takes one look at her and she, he says, she's got demons. I said, I told you that. So we start praying over my wife, and we are getting nowhere. I mean, we are binding, we're loosing, we bound the strong man, we got some oil, we slapped it on her head, we are, we are praising God, we're pleading the blood of Jesus, we're, and a partridge in a febrile pear tree. And nothing is working. She got worse, not better. Now, I knew that we had authority in Christ. And I was smart enough to know that if something's not working, it's not God's fault. I'm not making the connection somewhere here. But that doesn't cause, that doesn't, let me tell you something, folks. That doesn't make it any better when you're going through something like that. Because this was horrible. I mean, the fear came, I mean, no, the devil works by fear. The fear came on me was so strong. And voices started talking to me because I had to work. I had to go to work. I had to work all day long knowing that I'm coming home to demon woman. And I'm working all day long and these voices are speaking in my ear and they're saying this. Your wife is crazy and you're going to go crazy. You're next. And I'm getting weaker because I can't sleep. How can you sleep with somebody like that? You see, one night when I came home, she's, she's, she seemed like she's okay. She's making dinner. She's chopping with a knife. The next, I turn around. I thought, well, maybe we got victory over this. I turn around and here she comes with a knife at me. And she's going to stick me. And I had to grab her, hit, you know, hit that knife out of her hand, and I had to keep her away from the kitchen utensils. How can you sleep when you think your wife may grab a knife and cut your throat, folks? It was horrible. Now, I tell this story wherever I go. I tell a lot on the road because people need to know this, especially in California, moving right along, because that went over so good. But <laughs> he knows, he knows where, he, he's from down where we used to live. Anyway, so, so I, I tell this story a lot because it gets people's attention. How, how many noticed it did get your attention? So I'm thinking, my God, man, what am I going to do? I mean, I was, because physically you get tired. Now, I went through three days of this and I was exhausted. I was totally gone, spent. 
I just had no energy left. I had, I had no, and this is getting worse, and my pastor had given up on us. Real man of God, he was, you know. So I'm over there, and I'm thinking, well, now God, this is between you and me. I know you called me. I know that you told me to marry this girl. And I'm just not going to let the devil have her. But Lord, I've done everything I know to do. And this can't go on anymore like this. At least I hope it can't. You know, I'm thinking, I, you know, we've got to get victory. What's the, what's the, what's, what in the world is going on here? So I got desperate with God. And I began to pray like that and I got quiet. Because I was blasting in tongues and everything. I got quiet. And a word right down here. How many know God lives in your belly? Out of your what? Belly shall flow. See, all of a sudden there was this word rolled right up like this, this luggage. And, and, and I said, Lord, send me a sign. Send me a, a you know, I was, anything. Do something. Give me a scripture. Luggage. Third time. This over a period of about 15 minutes. Finally, it, the third time, luggage. I, and I caught a hold of it and I said, Lord, are you trying to show me something about luggage? Well, I mean, what could that possibly have to do with anything? How many know my wife is from Central America? Right? She's from Panama, Central America. So I went over and I grabbed the luggage because, you know, she had all this luggage she had brought with her. I never even looked in her luggage or anything, you know. I didn't. So I pull this out and I open up her luggage and she's got all kinds. Now see what happened was when my wife was a little baby, they took her to the Catholic church and baptized her as a Catholic. Now how many know that's bad? Because I'm just going to tell everybody, Catholic church is just nothing but witchcraft. Okay, I, I'm just going to say that. I love Catholics. I got friends who are Catholics, and I believe some people are Christians that are in the Catholic Church, but they're practicing a form of witchcraft. Yeah. Now, I know that doesn't make a lot of people around here comfortable, and they may, I might get cards and letters. Don't send me cards and letters. I don't care. Let me say it again. Catholics are practicing, many of them, a form of witchcraft. You can't pray to the saints. You can't pray. So that's all witchcraft. That's just that came in from uh, the occult world. Mixed with Catholicism. Now, down in Panama, Central America, and other places, they mix their Catholicism, though, which is bad enough, right? With other forms of things, and they have this thing called Santeria. Now, Santeria is bad because it is a form of more powerful witchcraft. And then they have another form that's even darker than that. It's called Palomalo. I, can't, I didn't pronounce that right, so don't send me any letters. Palo Malau, or something like that, that comes from like Haiti or something, which is the guys that were down in, in Matramotos, Mexico, who, where they found them all were, were involved in that. That, that. that is a very evil black magic. And so they took Stella, and they took her to the witch and the priest, and she was baptized, and they call in, in, in that, and call these spirits down into her with blood and all that. And so they laid claim to her. Now, see, when, you're, when parents allow, see, parents, can, they have a lot of authority in the home. Oh, yes. Are you all listening to me now real good? Yeah. Jesus never healed a child without the parent's permission Amen. in the Bible. Or whoever was in charge. Of that child. I want to qualify that. You, you have to understand, God works that way. He's a God of divine order. When He gives somebody authority, He doesn't take it away. This is why we got so many dead churches. When He puts somebody in authority, if they want to be a dead church and they got dead leadership, He won't play with it. Somebody says, We can pray them all into revival. Probably not. Yeah. Now, so I got this situation. I didn't know all of that, folks. I had no idea about that. We hadn't talked about any of this. She didn't know. In fact, she didn't even know she had these evil spirits. But when they moved in with me, all of a sudden they started manifesting because light, you know, how many know light's going to flush out darkness, folks? That's the way it is. Now, it's a blessing in disguise, but at the time it's not. You know what I mean? So I'm going through this whole thing. So I'm sitting here going, what is this? Luggage. I go pull that luggage out, and in the luggage she had charms and fetishes and voodoo things and Catholic things and all kinds of occultic things that had been sent with her as good luck charms and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. I took all of those things and we put them in a, in a, in a, in a bag. I took them down to my work and we burned them and she was set free. Hallelujah. Amen. She, was, she would not have been set free. We, she, we couldn't get her set free before those things were burned. Amen. 
So you can't have one spiritual principle over here work in one spiritual principle and think it's going to work if you're breaking another one, even if you don't know what it is. This is what happened to these guys. They brought that accursed thing over there. It affected the whole 3 million population. Now people say, oh, that, does, that kind of stuff wouldn't affect me. Folks, I, I went in there, you know, I mean, I, I, I have friends all over the world. I got to say this. I go out and preach different places, California, different places a lot. And a lot of my friends are Native American friends. I got, they're, they're all, they love me. They bring me stuff, knives all the time. I got the coolest knives. <laughs> but a lot of their belief system, as an example, I had a, uh, over here in, in Kiwani where I live, I had somebody call me up and said, our house is haunted. That's always fun. <laughs> Can you come help us with this situation? I said, sure, I'll come over. So I went over there. You know, they're young Christians, baby Christians. They had been get, being tormented by a demon that followed them around for 20-something years. I mean, stuff would float, fly off the deal, you know, explosions, all kind of wild stuff. And they were telling me about all this. So I went back and I, and I asked some questions. And I got some of the history. That's why I do it. I said, okay, we're going to pray for you. Then we're going to pray, you know, and, and we're going to pray for the house and, and all this. And I want to look around because w w will you throw away everything I ask you to throw away? Yes, we'll do anything. And when they're like that, you know, you got something you can work with there. So, so we go through the whole thing, anointing their house. I really didn't find a whole lot in their house. They, they, they already understood the principle pretty much. And, and so, you know, uh, so I'm, I'm, I said, well, we're going to pray over the house, and I believe it's going to be okay. And I'm, I said, where are, where are you getting most of the manifestations? And all the manifestations were coming from, like, one room over here that was connected to all the other rooms and a wall. So I went around to this wall, and on their wall was one of those dream catchers. You know what I'm talking about, dream catcher? Native American dream catcher. I said, that's your problem. How long have you had that? Oh, that was given to me by our father. That was a special gift. I said, you got to get rid of that. Oh, it's going to be hard. I said, you want, to, you want to get rid of this? She says, well, how? I explained it to her. Okay, we took it out. They never have had a problem since. But see, the enemy had a way in. How can, you mean a thing like that can cause the enemy to be able to come in and you can't do anything? Yeah, you can bind loose, cast out, scream, shout, and everything else. And the devil has a way in. He won't leave. Now, I've proved this out all over America and around the world. I've seen this work over and over and over. People go into their homes, start checking things out. Things will change. Let's go over here to uh, Acts chapter 8. Can we do that? How much time I got there, Scott? You guys get anything out of this? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Well, we better check this out since we got pastors telling us it's okay to play a Ouija board. I wouldn't have it. My, I wouldn't have nobody near that place. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have my. If my, my children went there, I'd have them come to have me pray for them. Because yeah. you get affected by that when somebody like that lays hands on people in a congregation. You better know who's laying hands on you. Yeah. I just don't let anybody lay hands on me. My wife and I went to California to one of these prophets meetings. Now there is a move of God. I believe in personal prophecy. We have them here, don't we? Yeah. But I know these guys. You think I'm going to let some guy in here that I don't, I, I'm, you know, don't know or whatever? We were out there, and this guy was, these people were advertising, come tomorrow. Come tomorrow, because everybody who comes is going to get a word from the prophet. Right there, I knew that's not right, because you can't give everybody a word. You can't do that unless the Holy Ghost comes on you. You can't prophesy. You can't, I decided I'm going to prophesy to Peggy right now. You can't do that. I said, honey, I don't, I don't want to go to that. And I, I kept telling the people we're with, we don't want to go to that. Oh, come on. You know, it won't hurt you. We, we're, we're, we're here. We want to stay. I don't want to go to that. But I don't have a car. They do. Well, you know. So finally, we are back and forth. And my, and my wife, she certainly didn't want to go. Finally, they said, well, just go eat lunch and we'll leave. No problem. Nothing will happen. So we get over there. And the first thing this guy does. Now, listen, this is funny. You all know me pretty well, right? This guy jumps up and he comes over there and he, and he starts prophesying over me. Now, I didn't let him touch me, but he, he grabs Stella. And he says, yay, yay, your husband has been abusing you for years and, and beating you up. 
for years. I'm thinking I'm about ready to beat you up for years. Seriously, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get unsanctified and knock this guy. Well, never mind. Out, and not feel bad about it. Maybe repent later. But not really. I love him when he's down. He, I mean, and 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 the people that we were with, they they went. Oh, they were aghast that anybody would would say that I would do such a thing as that. You know. This guy was was going off, and we just jumped up and we we just left. But Stella had, was shaking all over. When she got in the back of the car, she was crying and shaking because that, that thing had went from him into her and we had to cast it out of her. So don't think this is not a serious issue right now in the church world. I'm not trying to get anybody afraid. I'm, just, I'm trying to say, you got to know who's laying hands on you and you got to know what churches you're going to and you got to find out what they're practicing. Come on. Now, I told you, Acts chapter what? Eight? Let's look down at verse five. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Everybody look up at me. Samaria was half Jews. They were Jewish people that had mixed with the heathens. They were practicing magic and all kinds of heathenistic things, but they were Jews. Now, this is really part, unfortunately, of the Jewish history, you know. And you know, there's a lot of occultism that comes, comes from the Jewish people because they got involved in these practices. And that's why God was trying to stop that, you know. Now, not all Jewish people are involved in that. You understand what I'm talking about. But I'm just saying these were. These people, God had told them, do not mingle with these people. They did it anyway. So the Jews, the religious Jews, we'll call them, would always say to those people, you're like dogs. Remember the Samaritan woman that came to Jesus and, uh, you know, the, they, you know, you're a dog and all that kind of thing. That's what that, that was. I mean, the Samaritans were just like, in the eyes of the Jewish people, no, they were the worst, you know. But, you know, it's interesting because God got them filled with the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. And the next place you see them getting same filled with the Holy Ghost is Samarit, Samaria. And that's God's mercy and grace. He loves everybody. So let's, let's read this, but I wanted to point that out to you. This is an occultic place. So Philip goes down, verse 6. The people with one accord giving heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies that were lame were healed. Now notice, the ones that were healed, it came after the demons came out. So here he goes, he starts preaching to these people, and because they're involved and linked with the occult world, demons are coming out of them. Isn't that interesting? When he preached Christ unto them, these demons would manifest. They came out, people were getting healed of the palsy, and then it says there was great joy in the city. Now I want you to notice this. There was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was someone great. This man is famous in history. In history and the history of the occult world, this man's name is Simon Magnus. He was one of the most powerful sorcerers there is in the history of the world. I don't know if this is true or not. I don't care. But the legend says this guy could levitate and fly. And he had bewitched Samaria with the sorcery. They were under his spell. And how many know that he was in charge and was probably making a ton of money off of these people? And they came down, Philip came down and preached Christ to him. And here comes this guy. And verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed. And he, and he was baptized. And he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. How many know God can outdo anything the devil can do? Now, when the apostles were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent down Peter and John. It's interesting. They sent the apostles. I think they needed to uh, help establish a church there. So they needed apostles, not an evangelist, right? Different gifts. But they also needed something, uh, something else. Verse 15. Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They'd just been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they did baptize them, but they didn't get filled with the Holy Ghost yet. And that was important. The first thing that has to happen to a person after they get saved is get filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, baptism is important, but you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And I mean, by being filled with the Holy Ghost, I mean you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost and, and, and speak with other tongues, get your prayer language. 
That is vital. Absolutely vital. If you don't have that, you need to get it. Absolutely vital. Especially in this day, because you cannot and will not be able to live with all of what's going to go come up on the earth in victory without having all the tools you can get, man. People ask me sometimes, I don't know if I need that tongue stuff. Why do I need that? First Corinthians chapter 4 says it improves you. You need improvement? Then get it. Amen. Quit it. Quit arguing with God. Jump in and get whatever you need and run with it. We're a supernatural people. We need the supernatural power of God. And to be able to deal with what I'm talking about, you're going to have to operate in the supernatural. Uh, that made me feel good. So, they come down there and they pray. Now look at verse 17. They laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Saying, give me also the power that whosoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. You know what he was thinking of? Talking about making money the other way. Man, I'm really going to make it now. Now how many know you can't buy the gifts of God? This guy's heart wasn't right. But I want you to notice something about this. It does not say here that they spoke in tongues. But we know they did. Because it actually does say that. Because as you go down, verse 20, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. You notice that? You know the word matter there. I looked it up years ago because I, I caught on to this. How, what, did, what, did, what did Simon see? I mean, when you lay, you can't see the Holy Ghost. When you lay hands on somebody, what did he see that he, it was utterance? You know that, that word matter there is translated almost everywhere else, utterance. No part, no, nor, nor law in this utterance. They were speaking, we know that from church history, number one. Number two, that was utterance in the Holy Ghost, had to be, same thing. How many know uh, that the Bible, uh, guys who translated that didn't do a very good job of helping us with that particular scripture? But I just helped you. And you got to understand something. So, the first thing they needed was to get filled with the Holy Ghost. And so, folks, it's interesting. When he preached Christ to these people, because they were linked with the occult world, these demons were coming out of them. That was the main sign. That's the thing they needed was to be delivered. Isn't that interesting? The second that they began to preach Christ, they got set free from these. Now, I want to go to another scripture. Because the Bible doesn't teach us everything in one shot. I'm sure a lot of things went on in that city. But go to Acts chapter 19 real quick, will you? Please. Now I want to show you this. I got this uh, up so that you can see this. And let's look at verse 1. And it came to pass that while, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, finding certain disciples. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? First thing Paul says to them, Got the Holy Ghost yet? <laughs> First thing. Why? Because it was so important. He knew that they needed, because Ephesus was involved in some of the mo most perverted forms of uh, witchcraft and idolatry and everything else. And those people were all involved as part of their life, part of their religion. They grew up that way. It was in their families. We have not so heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. He said unto them, unto, unto what were you baptized? They said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with baptism and repentance, saying unto the people they should believe on Jesus Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. When Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. The men were about 12. So here Paul gets 12 of them filled with the Holy Ghost. The church is on, right? Amen. Now they're in a heathenistic city that is filled with some of the most abominational, some of the most, I mean, the, uh, some of the stuff they were doing, I can't even talk about in church. Yeah, yeah. But I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you this way. They went into temples with prostitutes and had orgies as part of their worship. I mean, just stuff that was just really nasty and bad and it was all over and it was part of their culture. They were bisexual and homosexual and other sexuals and everything else. I mean, they were, it was all the Greek philosophies and all this stuff mixed with occultism and occultism. It's a very interesting mix of stuff. Verse 8, and when he went into the synagogues, he spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of the way, 
before the multitudes, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of Tyrannius. And this continued for the space of two years. So for two years, he's preaching to people here, teaching, so that all that were in, dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So he had literally, some way or another, got a hold and got to everybody. Now look, verse 11. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. You ever notice that? Why? So that from his body were, were, uh, were brought unto, unto the sick handkerchiefs and aprons, and diseases departed from them, and evil spirits came out of them. Look up at me. Why would God do that? Was there a purpose for that? Why there? What was important about that? I'll tell you what it was. The occultists did that stuff. When you would go see one of them, they would give you a charm, a fetish, a thing, or this or that. And supposedly you were supposed to take it home. And you were supposed to attach it to you. And you're supposed to be healed. Or you're supposed to this. Or you're supposed to get a blessing. Or you're supposed to whatever. They'd give you some kind of magical thing that was supposed to do this. They were used to that. So God anointed Paul to do the real thing. When they took that home, all those demons that were attached to all that other stuff would leave. Healing would really take place. They saw how much more God's power was powerful than what they were involved with. Can you all say amen? amen? Now, we know that there's a lot of evil spirits around because in the next verse, in verse 13, then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, look up at me, exorcism or the rite of exorcism like in the Catholic Church is nothing more than magic. Again, they get people delivered sometimes because they do use the name of Jesus and stuff. And God is merciful. But if you look at it, it's another ritual of magical ritual that came down. And they call out the names of demons and years past and all kinds of weird stuff. Half of it's a bunch of occultism itself. Amen. Now these Jews that were doing these exorcisms... We're getting paid big money. And this was big business because there was a lot of people who had demons. They're full of them. Are you all listening to me real good now? I mean, this is big business. You can't have occultism and cultism and, and, and evil worship and all the things they are doing and not get demons. You can't do that. The two are connected. So these guys were going around and they had a pretty good business. Ghostbusters, I'm just using that term. They come in here and they had found out that Paul was casting these things out in the name of Jesus. They saw that. They thought, wow, that works better than anything we've ever done. Let's use that name of Jesus. No, I'm serious. This is what they thought. So they, be, they took upon them, them to call over them, which had evil spirits, to the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom this Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jew, and a chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? I like that, don't you? Jesus knows who I am. The demons know who I am. The demons know who you are. Glory to God forevermore. Amen. If you got your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, demons know who you are. And they're afraid of you. If you just understood it, you got authority over them. In fact, a lot of times they're tormenting you. Why don't you turn the boat on them? Why don't you give it back to them a little bit? Why don't you stand up and say, you know what? I read the back of the book there in Revelation chapter 20. Uh, you're going to end up in the lake and it's not Tahoe, so shut up. <laughs> in Jesus' name. We should be putting the hammer back on him, not letting him put the hammer on us. But you can't use the name of Jesus unless you got the name of Jesus by birthright of being washed in the blood of Jesus. You can't use the name of Jesus. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overcame them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This guy ripped their clothes off, and they came running out of there naked. I like to see Mel Brooks make a movie out of this. Yeah. <laughs> the guy comes out of there naked as a jaybird. Uh, the, these exorcists run out, you know, Ghostbusters, naked. Wouldn't that make a good movie? Come running out of there naked as a jaybird, because they tried to use the name of Jesus, but the name of Jesus is not for anybody to use except for the believer. And this was known to all the Jews. It spread around. Things like that spread. 
Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell upon all of them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Now, now notice what happens next. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also was used curious arts, magic, witchcraft, brought their books together, burned them before all men. They, content, they counted the price of them and found that it was 50,000 pieces of silver, which is millions of dollars today. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. These people that were involved in these things came. The Holy Ghost, I'm sure Paul talked talk, talk to them about it. They brought their occultic stuff and they burned it. And the word of God began to spread across everything. As the occult went down and Jesus went up. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I want to encourage you today. Make sure you watch what goes into your homes. Make sure you watch what your children are watching. The toys that they bring into their homes. Things you might have from other lands. Things you might have in your cultures. I went over to Norman and Lynette's and they had some, some things from Native American Indian cultures and we had to get rid of that stuff. You know, and they were healed. Amen. They had to just had a, I'll talk about that next week, we don't have time now. But isn't that good? Yeah. Do you know how many times I've seen people get blessed when they understood the connection of this? And they begin to deal with that. Pokemon and what else? There's a thousand different things. You see, the occult world knows that if they can get into the home, demons can be released into our children and into our lives. And it doesn't make any difference whether we understand it or whether we don't. It, it will happen. We don't need it. Why do you think every other program is supernatural? Stand to your feet.